afternoon. I am George Beebe. I am Director of Grand Strategy at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, a think tank dedicated to advancing the cause of realism and restraint in American foreign policy. Our subject today is potential paths to a ceasefire in Ukraine, uh, a discussion that is going to focus on a recent uh, brief authored by Anatole Levin, who is the director of the Eurasia program here at the Quincy Institute. Anatole is joined by a distinguished panel of experts who will be commenting on his paper and on the broader subject of potential paths to peace in Ukraine. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs is director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Miriam Pemberton is associate fellow uh, at the Institute for Policy Studies. And Thomas Graham is distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Anatole, let's start with you. Uh, could you please give us a, a short synopsis of, of your brief on this subject? Thank you, George. Yes, well, my, my brief uh, argues um, that uh, a formal peace settlement, uh, not just now, but for the foreseeable future, will be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to achieve in Ukraine, uh, because the positions of uh, the two sides, and indeed the West and Russia as well, uh, are simply too far apart, uh, especially on the territorial issue. Uh, Ukraine has um, declared that uh, the return of all the territory lost by Ukraine since 2014, including Crimea, is non-negotiable, and Russia has declared that uh, its annexations, uh, what it calls annexations, are non-negotiable. Non uh, however, my paper argues that this does not uh, exclude the possibility of a ceasefire, and it points to other examples uh, around the world, some well-known Cyprus, Kashmir, uh, some actually not seen in these terms, but nonetheless, I think, relevant uh, between the Republic of Ireland and Britain uh, between 1922 and 1999, uh, to show that lasting ceasefires, more or less stable, are possible even uh, when the, the fundamental issues between the countries concerned remain open. Of course, a ceasefire is also uh, an essential precondition uh, for serious talks on a future comprehensive settlement. Uh, my paper argues that total victory for either side is highly unlikely. If by total victory for Ukraine, you mean an actual Ukrainian military conquest of Crimea, a uh, total victory for Russia in terms of overrunning the whole of Ukraine looks completely impossible by now, given Russia's failures. So what the war is basically about by now uh, is the lines uh, on which a ceasefire will eventually be drawn, um, the lines of control on the ground, in my view. And uh, we can't make any concrete progress towards a ceasefire uh, until the results of the planned Ukrainian counteroffensive are known. In other words, you know, what happens on the battlefield. However, I argue that whatever the military results of the Ukrainian uh, offensive this summer, uh, there is likely to be um, increasing uh, pressure for a ceasefire come the autumn or winter. Uh, because if uh, Ukraine succeeds in breaking through to this uh, and um, drives the Russians back, uh, there have certainly been uh, serious uh, hints by the Biden administration that at this point they will use a Ukrainian victory uh, to try to pressure Russia uh, into um, seeking a ceasefire, but on more on Ukrainian terms. Uh, Jeff, uh, could you mute yourself? Because because uh, you're sorry. Um, uh, but be partly because uh, Washington fears that if Ukraine then goes on to try to conquer Crimea, given the tremendous strategic, emotional, political importance of Crimea to, to Russia, then Russia might very well escalate or begin a cycle of escalation that could potentially end in nuclear war. Uh, if, on the other hand, Russia, uh, the Ukrainians fail very badly, 
and Russia counterattacks successfully, then of course uh, there will be pressure uh, to seek a ceasefire in order to save Ukraine from losing more territory, but also to, uh, of course, um, ward off the alternative if we are to help Ukraine, uh, which would be actually a much deeper engagement uh, of US and Western forces, perhaps to the point of direct war with Russia. Uh, so that will also lead to uh, pressure for a ceasefire. Uh, if, on the other hand, which may seem, given dynamics on the battlefield in recent months, the most likely outcome, uh, neither side makes large gains and we have a continuation of um, a, a, a stalemate on the ground, uh, then there have been considerable indications from many of uh, Western countries, especially in Europe, uh, but also in the US Congress, that uh, if there is no serious prospect of an early and complete Ukrainian victory, uh, then uh, present levels of Western aid are not sustainable to Ukraine, uh, nor indeed perhaps are Ukrainian reserves of manpower, uh, given the huge casualties on both sides that have occurred. Uh, and that will also lead to uh, pressure for a ceasefire. Um, now, uh, I've said that this ca cannot begin, you know, until the results of the offensive are known. Uh, but um, I also argue that uh, the United States needs to begin laying the groundwork for this now, thinking seriously uh, about what its aims in Ukraine actually are, and also beginning to reach out to potential interlocutors. Uh, China especially, but there are potentially other countries around the world which, if they can't bring influence to bear on Russia, uh, could nonetheless play uh, a useful diplomatic role, like Brazil, for example. Uh, and um, finally, I uh, argue or remind people that even if uh, a ceasefire leads to a frozen conflict in which some portions of Ukrainian territory remain uh, not legally, but in practice, in Russian hands. By far the greater part of Ukraine uh, will be definitively free, independent of Russian control, and indeed by now of any Russian influence, and free to move or to try to move towards full membership of the West. And this would mark a colossal victory for Ukraine, and indeed for Ukraine's Western backers, and a colossal defeat for Russia, not just in terms of Russia's ambitions when this war began, which we must remember uh, involved an attempt uh, to subjugate the whole of Ukraine and turn it into a client state, or on the other hand, uh, to break off about half of the country. Um, that has gone on defeated completely. Uh, but equally importantly, this is a colossal victory for Ukraine and defeat for Russia in the context of the history of the past 400 years of Russian domination over Ukraine. Uh, so just to remind people, uh, we have already won a very great victory in Ukraine, uh, no matter what the eventual lines uh, of a ceasefire, if a ceasefire comes to be. Thank you. That's a summary of the paper. Great. Thank you very much, Anatole. Um, I now want to uh, turn to our other panelists for reactions to this, not just to the paper, but to some of the broader uh, issues that are at stake in, uh, in this war. I want to start with Jeffrey Sachs. Jeffrey, what are your thoughts on this? Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm glad we're talking about uh, ceasefires and negotiations because I think it's the uh, only way to avoid disaster. I don't think there's been any great victory by anybody now or in the future. I think this has been an unmitigated tragedy and disaster. Uh, I believe that this war was wholly avoidable. The uh, US-Russia security agreement put uh, on the table as a draft on December 17, 2021, was a workable basis for negotiation between the United States and Russia. At the core 
of this was uh, that NATO would not enlarge to Ukraine. I regard the uh, attempt to enlarge NATO to Ukraine, which predates Putin by many, many years, by the way, because this has been in the works since the early 1990s as a grave foreign policy overreach of the United States. And I think the war could have been avoided on that basis. Uh, I also believe that the war could have been avoided if that had been coupled with the commitment to honor the Minsk II agreements, which my Ukrainian friends told me all along, no way, no how, we're never going to abide by it. Uh, and yet <laughs> this was uh, not only an agreement reached uh, about uh, the Donbass, but it was also uh, backed by the UN Security Council uh, and the brazenness with which Ukraine blew it off was, uh, in my view, a huge mistake for the United States and Ukraine, because this was basically a joint decision of the US and Ukraine all along. Uh, stepping back, I think it was a very bad idea for the United States to be deeply involved in the violent overthrow of uh, Viktor Yanukovych, which to my mind triggered this conflict as a violent conflict from the start. I saw with my own eyes the deep U.S. engagement. I disliked it heartily at the time and think that it uh, triggered uh, a lot of uh, these events. So in my view, uh, we need to uh, step back and understand that we're in this mess from a lot of very bad foreign policy decisions taken by the United States over many, many years and a failure of diplomacy at the end of 2021, because even on that late date, this war could have been avoided. Where are we on the battlefield? Uh, it depends on which uh, blogger you listen to. Uh, the diametrically opposed narratives that we hear from the mainstream Western media and from uh, the more Russian sympathetic media is astounding to me because I listen to both sides every day and it's as if it's uh, two completely different descriptions. Uh, but I think uh, if if there is if, if there is some weight of the evidence, I would say that the more likely side, in my view, uh, is that Russia has the upper hand on the battlefield because of the advantage in artillery uh, and in munitions, uh, and that the Western stockpiles really are low and falling, uh, and that uh, one wonder weapon after another has proven not to be such a wonder weapon. Now, both sides escalate, and I believe that the West can escalate, and I believe that Russia would escalate in response. And I think that the escalation could well take us to nuclear war. Uh, I wouldn't discount that for one moment. That's why I think Obama was correct in 2014 when he said in effect uh, that Russia has uh, escalatory dominance in this conflict. It views this issue as existential. We view it as convenience uh, and Russia would escalate all the way to the ultimate uh, point, which is a nuclear war. And uh, Obama rightly said, I don't want to play poker uh, with that uh, game. Uh, at hand because whatever we do will be matched and upped. And we're told all the time uh, on our side, oh, don't worry about nuclear blackmail. I just want to say for whatever it's worth, I'm scared uh, to death about it because uh, I've been studying uh, nuclear tactics and strategy for decades uh, and examine them closely. And we've got a lot of people on all sides who believe that these weapons can and should be used. Uh, and so I think that it's terrifying the path that we're on. So my guess is on the on the battlefield, Russia has the upper hand. But if I'm wrong and Ukraine has the upper hand, it doesn't make anything better at all.
from this regard. Uh, so to my mind, we face, I guess, actually, just before I say what we face, just one more point. I never quite understand the logic of, well, the offensive will go forward, then we'll see where we are. The offensive will probably kill tens of thousands of people. Uh, it could trigger nuclear war. I, in all my experience in 40 years, which admittedly is on economic crises, not military crises, uh, waiting for the next uh, disaster to happen is, is never a good idea. I'd rather that we start negotiations today rather than wait to see how uh, Ukraine's uh, counteroffensive is going to play out and whether it's 50,000 deaths or 100,000 deaths or complete debacle or they overtake Crimea, I would rather turn today to negotiations. Uh, I'd hate to see Ukraine bifurcated in the end, and I don't think that uh, even a bifurcated Ukraine, which is chopped up at the Dnieper, uh, and uh, the West thinks now, the Western part thinks, okay, now we can join NATO, that that's going to lead to peace either. Uh, we need space between the superpowers, <laughs> really. Uh, the best idea all along was Yanukovych's idea that Ukraine should be neutral. Uh, and uh, if Yanukovych had not been overthrown, Ukraine would not be at war. Uh, it would not be losing vast uh, numbers of its young men. It would not have millions as refugees. It would not be in the process of being turned into America's latest Afghanistan. So uh, to my mind, we should stop the war today, not wait to see uh, what uh, the next counteroffensive is going to bring. But I really appreciate the spirit of this initiative, which is to say there is no end based on a military uh, outcome. The end to this is politics and negotiation. Uh, and in my view, it is Russia goes home and NATO doesn't go in. And I think that was on the table uh, for decades, actually. Uh, but too many in the U.S. Uh, government, including the president himself, would not say the words NATO will not move forward. And that's been, from my point of view, America's diplomatic failure. So back over to you, George. Great, thank you. Uh, Tom, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, one of the arguments against seeking uh, a negotiated uh, settlement of some kind has been that uh, A, the Ukrainians and Russians are very far apart, and B, uh, the Russians, to a great degree, are not willing to be a negotiating partner for anyone in all of this. What are your thoughts? You know, if we were to seek uh, some sort of negotiated end to the fighting, is there uh, an interlocutor in Russia that is willing to talk about that? And what might that look like? Well, thank you, George. I think it's a good question. And uh, uh, we're having a good discussion at this point. Uh, you know, the impression that I have uh, developed over the past several months uh, is that uh, at this point, at least, we don't have a, a negotiator on the Russian side. Um, I think the scenarios that, that Anatole laid out in his paper about what happens on the battlefield uh, will lead to the increased discussion in the United States and Europe uh, about movement towards a ceasefire. Um, you know, uh, the impression I have from uh, some of the conversations that I've had in Washington uh, is that U.S. government officials are already thinking about uh, if not pushing for a ceasefire, at least what um, what a negotiated settlement might look like uh, when the moment arrives uh, when we can actually have uh, negotiations. Uh, you know, I think the the problem is that no matter what happens on the battlefield, uh, it's hard to see that the Russians themselves will be interested in either a ceasefire uh, or uh, more broader negotiations about this conflict uh, at the moment. Uh, indeed, I think one of the problems that we have is that um, a further public discussion of this in the West, and this is a natural thing, uh, reinforces the view in the Kremlin that time is on their side uh, and that uh, they can wait out whatever the West is prepared to do with Ukraine uh, 
uh, exhaust Ukrainian resources, uh, that Russia is going to be more resilient, uh, that the politics in the West uh, will not allow for continued support for Ukraine, and that we have a presidential election in the United States uh, coming up uh, next year uh, that could lead to a change in administrations uh, and a, a, better, uh, a better president from the standpoint uh, of the Kremlin. So no matter what happens on the battlefield, whether it's a, a tremendous Ukrainian success, uh, a, a stalemate, uh, or a successful Russian counteroffensive, uh, there's very little uh, interest uh, on the Russian side in moving towards a ceasefire at this point. That's point one. Uh, point two uh, is that over the past several months, uh, we've seen no interest uh, on the part of the, of the Russians in actually opening up a serious dialogue with Washington. Uh, Washington uh, has made a, uh, at least a couple of attempts to do this, um, uh, to open up a broad dialogue, not only about uh, Ukraine and the conflict in Ukraine, but about the broader set of issues uh, that uh, divide our two countries at this point. Uh, and the response that they've gotten from the Kremlin uh, is that we're not interested uh, in that type of dialogue at this moment. Uh, if the occasion uh, arises when we think there's an urgent need to talk to, you, to the Americans about some, something, we know how to contact you, we will contact you at this point. Uh, you know, that doesn't preclude sort of the lower level sort of technical discussions that are going on uh, over prisoner exchanges, uh, for example, and some other matters. But these broader strategic issues, uh, the Kremlin has shown no interest in discussing with the United States at this point. So I think that's one of the great challenges going forward. Uh, you know, I think, you know, we would all like to move this toward the ceasefire uh, into a broader discussion of a, a resolution, not only of the problems in Ukraine, but the broader questions of European security. Uh, the Russians have to be an integral part of that. Uh, but uh, developing or finding the partner uh, to sit down and have that conversation uh, so far hasn't uh, been successful. Uh, consideration is being given to other ways to do this. But in many ways, the decision lies in the Kremlin as to whether they are prepared uh, to bring this conflict to an end and uh, try to resolve the broader issues. Now, yes, um, they are probably disappointed in what happened back in uh, December 2021, January, February 2022. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, you can't begin the negotiations at this point uh, without uh, the Russians willing to talk. Uh, and that means that they're going to have to put back behind them whatever happened uh, before the conflict began uh, in order to engage in serious talks with us. Thank you, Tom. Um, Miriam, um, I want to turn to you for your thoughts. And, and in particular, I know you've done a lot of work on the impact of war and, and militarization on economies. Um, not just uh, in Russia and Ukraine and the rest of the world, but in the United States. And I, I wonder if you might want to comment on the impact of prolonged war uh, in, in Ukraine on the shape of these economies. Yeah, so thanks for the opportunity to weigh in here a little bit. Um, so with respect to, uh, you know, war, warfare economies, um, you know, the Ukraine invasion made, uh, you know, an immediate pretext for for the U.S. to, um, you know, boost its defense budget through the roof, and, um, you know, those uh, communities that are dependent on defense spending are thinking, well, this may be a, you know, a real uh, a real boon for us. But um, in research I've done uh, over the past year in this this new book I've done. Um, I really look, uh, you know, with deep skepticism about, um, you know, yes, warfare economies uh, produce, um, you know, get get some people very rich, um, and uh, and and yet um, they are not um, the the sort of ticket to broad community prosperity that that people um, people think they are. So um, with respect to this, this paper, um, so in my mind, the essential goals of a just Ukraine policy um, <clears throat> would be, you know, 
uh, support Ukraine's sovereignty and right to defend itself, um, deny Putin his uh, dream of reconstituting the Soviet Union, uh, do our best to help minimize suffering and avoid uh, nuclear war. And I think the paper is a useful contribution to the search um, for a way to get to those goals. Um, I think it does a good job of arguing for waiting to push uh, for a ceasefire and settlement talks until the outcome of <clears throat> Ukraine's offensive is clearer. Um, I think the current calls for an immediate, immediate ceasefire just aren't realistic. Um, it's always honorable to make principled consistent stands for peace, um, but they're less valuable when they seem not well connected to the current reality. Um, the paper also makes a good case for that moment when the outcome of the uh, Ukraine offensive is clearer um, as a, as a, in the way that as a potential opening to a resolution. Um, and it helpfully grounds that argument in those three possible broad post offensive uh, scenarios. I like the emphasis of a cast of characters, including China, Brazil, India, and the UN, um, in addition to the principal supporters of Ukraine. Um, the idea of the US and China, you know, collaborating on a peace framework is of course an appealing prospect um, and could conceivably lead <clears throat> to reduce tensions uh, between the two countries. Uh, where I part company with the paper is flagged right there in the title, America needs to take the lead. Um, I'd say the world has experienced the US taking the lead uh, a lot over the years in all manner of interventions, armed and otherwise. Um, many of these have, of course, seeded resentments toward this superpower deciding that it's in everyone's best interest if the US calls the shots. Um, most obviously, there's the US global network of bases on every continent, which is obviously undreamed of by any other country. And this continues to create an array of those anti-access area denial threats um, that the military talks a lot about. So no, I don't think uh, America should take the lead in this, in this push for a ceasefire. It can be part of that push in back channel discussions going on as the offensive proceeds. Um, the paper uh, explains why France and Germany uh, can't take the lead, um, but it ignores the one global institution whose only purpose in this context is deconfliction, and that is, of course, the UN. Uh, the paper talks about the UN uh, being useful by providing um, peacekeeping troops. I think that's absolutely right. Um, but beyond that, I'd argue that the UN should be the convener with the support of uh, the US and the other partners mentioned. Um, I don't see how the US can broker an agreement because it appropriately, necessarily, justly supports one side over the other. Uh, the paper says that Russia will only trust an agreement brokered by the US. Um, I guess this is mostly because the US can lean on Ukraine the hardest. But I'd say um, that the prospect of an agreement brokered by the UN rather than the US is more likely to look to, P to Putin like a, uh, you know, a, some kind of face-saving arrangement um, if he eventually gets to looking for one. Um, an added benefit would of course be the chance to bolster the UN's legitimacy at the center of the world's search for peace. Um, I wonder if part of the reason for insisting that the US take the lead comes out of a desire to salvage the US's reputation after the debacles of the post 9-11 wars. But I think the way to salvage our reputation is by acting more as a global partner and less as the self-appointed indispensable nation. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, so Anatole, I've given our, our other panelists an opportunity to react to your thoughts. I'd like to now give you an opportunity to react to their thoughts. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, well, I, I mean, in response to Jeffrey, God knows I too would so much like to see peace now. And indeed, I mean, I, I, I think that the, I mean, a, a key question uh, about the future is not, as I say, whether one side or the other will win a complete victory, uh, but frankly, how many people have to die before 
um, both sides uh, give up their maximalist positions. Um, and unfortunately, and I mean, it is un not just unfortunate, but tragic, you know, we have seen so many examples in history uh, where um, it, you know, it is only when both sides have reached a, a, a point of exhaustion uh, and have come to recognize that they cannot achieve everything they want to, that you know, even a, a ceasefire becomes possible. Uh, that leads me to uh, Tom's point, and b believe me, I mean, I, I in no way um, underestimate the, um, the difficulties of all this. I think, however, you know, Tom said that there is um, no interlocutor on the Russian side, but one must also point out that the the, the repeated official public positions of Ukraine uh, categorically, I mean, equally categorically rule out a settlement. And the West has, of course, and the United States has publicly basically said that it's Ukraine that must decide. So seen from Moscow, uh, there isn't in fact, you know, unless the United States sends a pretty strong signal, in private at least, that it is prepared to uh, accept a compromise and bring influence to bear on Ukraine in that direction. Then seen from Moscow, there's also nothing uh, to, to talk about. And the, the truth is that when it comes to, well, two things, I mean, first, we just don't know, um, you know, what the, the, the thinking is of Putin's innermost circle. Uh, so you, but to judge by the latest remarks by Prigozhin, I mean, there is, uh, at least in sections of the Russian elites, there, 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 there is a, a feeling that this has all gone terribly badly wrong. Uh, and certainly, I mean, Russians, I, I know, who you know, Tom, Tom also knows very well, no doubt, um, uh, who are not obviously in the inner circle, uh, but do not believe that uh, Russia will get much more, can get militarily much more than it has now. So um, we we basically need to explore or try to explore what the, you know, what the lines are that Russia could accept. But once again, I have to say that that will not be, um, that will not be clear until the, the, the results of the, um, of the offensive are known. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, if not this year, at some stage, um, a piece of, a, you know, mutual exhaustion is a possibility. Um, you know, the indications are, and Rogozhin himself said this today, that Russian casualties have been enormous. Uh, we don't know exactly what Ukrainian casualties were, but I visited military cemeteries in Ukraine in March. Um, with thousands, literally, of dead in them. Um, you know, Ukraine is also suffering extremely badly. And if the Ukrainian government did get indications, which to some extent it already has, uh, that Western existing levels of Western support are not sustainable, well, conceivably, it would settle not formally, but de facto for, 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 for what it's, it's got, perhaps. And all this, you know, uh, uh, I've not stated any of this in, in the form of certainties, you know, only of possibilities to be explored or seized if they become available. Uh, on the United Nations, um, uh, I think here one needs to distinguish between a broker of an agreement and people who are committed to it. Uh, I also believe strongly um, in a a, a bigger role for the United Nations and perhaps a role for the UN as a broker and certainly for any stable ceasefire. Uh, I think UN peacekeepers would be not only valuable but possibly essential and a UN patrolled um, demilitarized zone. Uh, my point about the US however is that um, the, uh, uh, only the US does have uh, the ability in the end to bring the necessary uh, influence to bear on on Ukraine. Uh, and, you know, one must repeat, <laughs> in the end, you know, Ukraine has to agree. Um, 
and this is not a propaganda point of Washington, this is a fact. Ukraine obviously has to agree to any ceasefire, let alone a, a settlement. And from that point of view, it, it, America must show itself to be fully committed to and a participant in any ceasefire agreement. Because Jeff mentioned the failure of the of the Minsk II agreement, and it seems to me that a key reason for that failure, yes, I mean, Ukraine basically never intended to fulfill it. How far Russia did, we can't be entirely sure. Uh, but um, obviously, the point is that having endorsed the agreement, the, the US had no real commitment at all to make the Minsk agreement stick uh, and basically walked away from it. Uh, that is very you know, strong. And, and France and Germany, without the US, had neither the will nor ability to make an agreement stick. This is very present in, in the minds of the Russian elites. Uh, and you know, the, I saw a question in the in the chat about you know how can we trust Russia not to resume the war? Well, of course, seen from Moscow, you know, you have more and more talk in the West of turning Ukraine into a kind of Israel. You know, massively armed by permanently by the West as a militarized state. Uh, I have to remind people that um, you know Israel's record of um, you know sticking to. Um, the ceasefire lines has not been, shall we say, entirely um, un, uh, unmixed. And so obviously seen from Russia, it's just the mirror image of that. You know, what's to, to guarantee that the West won't in fact turn Ukraine into the kind of state which, unless the US is really committed to, um, to, to a ceasefire, will not itself resume the war at some stage in future in order to recover all its lost territory. So that's what I meant by the need for the United States to be fully committed to the process and to whatever outcome emerges, if one does. Great, thank you. So um, I'd like to now broaden this uh, discussion a little bit. We've talked about uh, the potential paths to peace in Ukraine, but uh, this question is actually um, embedded in a bigger question. Uh, what kind of relationship with Russia uh, between the United States on the one hand and Europe uh, and Russia is, is in American national interests? What should the broader vision be for what Europe looks like, uh, for what Ukraine's role in Europe should be, and for what Russia's relationship with Europe ought to be? Uh, because uh, my uh, experience has been that uh, the arguments about uh, to what degree the United States ought to be pursuing a negotiated settlement are a function of one's views on that bigger issue. So I want to invite the panelists to talk a little bit about that. Tom, can I start with you? Yeah, certainly. Look, I mean, I think that is the key question. Uh, you know, there isn't a settlement of the Ukraine crisis outside of a broader discussion and a broader settlement of the, the issues of European uh, European security. Uh, and so, you know, the challenge is uh, not for the United States uh, to, to broker a settlement um, of the Ukraine crisis. The United, you know, the challenge for the United States is to open up a broader discussion uh, of European security uh, in which uh, Ukraine is, is, is one of the subjects on the agenda. Uh, this is also one of the reasons uh, why the United States has to uh, play a central role uh, in the uh, in the discussion, uh, in part because uh, we, along with the Russians, are really the only two powers that have a uh, a significant ability to impact the, the broader strategic arrangements in Europe at this point. Uh, given the history, given the um, the way uh, the Russians and we think about, and where the Europeans themselves think about security uh, on the continent. So. Um, Think about the, the uh, Ukraine in that broader context, and we're talking about a series of, uh, of talks and negotiations, and not simply one thing focused on Ukraine uh, that involves Russia on one side, Ukraine on the other side, the sort of helpers on the inside. Um, you know, the challenge is to find a, uh, a stable type of uh, arrangement for European security over the long run. Um, 
you know, for that, we do need to have a Russia uh, that uh, is um, capable of governing itself, capable of maintaining command and control of its nuclear forces, uh, capable of entering into agreements and, um, uh, and then implementing them properly. Um, so, uh, you know, we shouldn't want uh, or desire a, uh, a, a significant uh, strategic defeat for Russia that destabilizes Russia to any great extent. So uh, there's a question of how we uh, posture ourselves going forward uh, uh, with the Ukraine, particularly on sanctions, for example. Um, and in the end, what we're going to have to come up with is a uh, something that we would call peaceful coexistence. Um, uh, you know, there will be a lot in this that looks like uh, the agreements that we had during the Cold War in terms of arms control. Uh, matters, for example, uh, location, dislocations of forces, military exercises. Uh, so we have a lot to build on that would have to be adapted to the current uh, situation where the dividing line between East and West has moved hundreds of miles uh, towards the um, uh, eastward uh, on the continent. Uh, that gives you a starting point for this, um, but uh, it will have to be broader than that. The Arctic has become an issue. Uh, now in the way it wasn't during the uh, during the Cold War, uh, that uh, creates comp complications, but it also opens up opportunities, uh, uh, given the role that the Arctic is going to play, not only in geopolitics, but in the broader issue of climate change, uh, which ought to be a, a unifying position uh, between uh, the United States uh, and Russia. Uh, there's also some question of uh, the role that, uh, that China might have to play in this broader discussion. So we may need to sort of broaden our sense of what European security is. Uh, now, it's not simply about what happens on the European continent. It's about what happens around the European continent in a way that we didn't think about that during the Cold War. China may have to, uh, a role to play uh, in part uh, in giving Russia's assurances that uh, it can uh, defend its own interest in whatever arrangements we make down the road. Uh, and obviously, um, uh, you know, part of European security will be dealing with the uh, sort of the, uh, the spillover uh, impacts of this conflict that go beyond simply the European continent uh, to neighboring regions, particularly North Africa, the Middle East, uh, where energy and food issues come into uh, to play. So just to uh, uh, make this point uh, uh, very quickly, we need to think of this as a broader set of negotiations. Uh, it expands out from uh, Russia, Ukraine, broader European security, uh, which then sp uh, spills out into a, a broader set of questions that have global ramifications. And that is going to require tremendous creativity on the part of people who take place in this, uh, particularly on Washington. It is going to challenge us to think differently about uh, security in Europe uh, going forward from the way we have over the past 60 to 70 years. Dr. Sachs, I want to turn next to you. Your thoughts on what, what broader vision should the United States have? <laughs> you, you know, this is an easy uh, answer, uh, but uh, a, a messed up situation. I was an uh, economic advisor to Gorbachev, to Yeltsin, to Kuchma, to Yushchenko. I, I've watched this from the beginning. The answer is simple. We should have normal relations. That was the intention after the uh, even the opening uh, of uh, Gorbachev and then after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in December 1991. The United States didn't want normal. It wanted hegemony. It wanted control. It did not want to listen to anybody. It did not want to hear that NATO enlargement was a threat despite the fact that James Baker and Hans Dietrich Genscher had repeatedly told Gorbachev not one inch eastward. And if anybody has any doubt, just go to the George Washington University National Security Archives and you can read everything in grim detail. We lied and we cheated. It started with Cheney, Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz. Uh, but then it continued with the Democrats. Uh, it continued with hardliners in the Democratic Party. 
then the Republican Party, then the Democratic Party, probably the, the only person who's been there all the time is Victoria Newland. <laughs> and, and we have played the unilateralist, don't ever tell us what to do attitude. And it's brought us to disaster and brought us to the threat of nuclear war, and it's brought Ukraine to complete disaster. The rules are don't overthrow governments uh, like we did in 2014. Don't push NATO to a 1,900 kilometer border with Russia. Don't blow up the Nord Stream pipeline. Don't uh, call the other side completely irrational, crazy, no one to negotiate, whereas it's Russia that has put on the table repeatedly the negotiating points I shared in the chat, uh, the uh, draft US-Russia security arrangements that were proposed on December 17, 2021. I begged the White House, this is fine, start talking. No, no, we don't have to talk to anybody about NATO enlargement. We, this is just between us, as if we would say, yeah, Mexico, you want to have a Russian military base? No problem. It's an open door. You know, we're so hypocritical. You can't even imagine how destructive. And Biden has flatly turned down negotiations. Now, from what I know from Naftali Bennett and what I know from Turkish mediators, the United States killed negotiations in March 2022. We're not, we're not lacking a diplomatic counterpart. We don't want the negotiations because our goal is to win. That's the problem. That's our goal. Our goal is to win. But winning makes no sense here. Winning means destruction of Ukraine and risk of nuclear escalation. So we want normal relations. And to simply say, well, Russia, that's the incorrigible country, is to neglect the last 34 years of history, which I personally have seen with my own eyes up close. There was nothing that blocked normal relations except the American arrogance to think we are the indispensable country and we do what we want. And if we could get over that mindset, we could find normal relations also with China and with other countries as well. Miriam, same question to you. What should our broader vision look like in all of this? Yes, well, I certainly agree with um, Jeff and others. I think everybody that NATO enlargement was um, was a huge mistake. Um, and you know, what do we do about it now? Uh, I don't think there's any way to you know rescind uh, membership. Or, and but I I hope that others are who know more about this than I do are are thinking through, you know, what are the ways to, um, you know, to diminish the impact uh, of, of this huge mistake. Um, certainly, I would say suspending, you know, more NATO memberships, uh, suspending the idea for Ukraine, focusing more on, on, U on EU membership, um, makes sense to me, but but I hope people are really uh, thinking that question through. Um, you know how to minimize the damage from uh, from NATO enlargement. Um, I think you know Russia um, uh, long term cannot be isolated. Should not be completely isolated from the world. It's not good for anybody. Um, so somehow without rewarding. Uh, Russian aggression, um, you know, when this comes to some kind of resolution, um, you know, I think steps to, uh, you know, to um, reduce that isolation, steps to reducing, you know, what are the steps to reducing uh, the sanctions, you know, arms control agreements, you know, all of that needs to be, um, needs to be pursued. And um, you know, I love Tom's uh, focus on you know broader negotiations and and broader potential points of agreement with with Russia, uh, with China. Um, you know, 
and I think the best of those and the most important is, of course, climate change. Okay, Anatole, um, same question to you. What should that broader vision look like? Well, I think in some ways the alternatives facing the United States are rather well set out in a, a recent piece by Elliot Cohen of The Atlantic, I, I believe, uh, in which it seems to me effectively he declares himself a Bolshevik, uh, rather surprisingly for, for him, but let me explain, uh, because he echoes um, what a number of other writers in America and of course many more people in Poland, the Baltic states and naturally Ukraine itself uh, have uh, said, uh, which is in effect, um, Ukraine can never be secure from future uh, Russian attack uh, unless uh, Russia is totally defeated. And indeed, um, people have uh, also said often um, that, uh, in private at least, that Russia itself must be broken up, destroyed. And Cohen, um, makes reference to, to 1917. He talks about the need for you know, Russian soldiers to mutiny, shoot their own officers, desert. Uh, well, shall we remember what happened as a result of that in 1917? Uh, is, uh, is Elliot Cohen, in fact, declaring himself for a new Bolshevik revolution? Except that in this case, it wouldn't be a Bolshevik revolution. Uh, as the latest remarks by um, Mr. Prigozhin uh, indicate we would be looking uh, much more likely at, um, to put it at its kindest, radical populism uh, from the nationalist right, coupled, of course, with chaos. Uh, and it's hard to see in the end how this could be to the advantage of the United States because it would imply endless insecurity in Europe um, and problems for the United States elsewhere in the world. Uh, and uh, as Tom has indicated, um, you know, the, the United States is facing serious challenges elsewhere. Uh, and both of you mentioned uh, climate change. Uh, for, for me, I've written you know, extensively on climate change, wrote a book on the subject. Uh, it, it is simply, it's worse than tragic. It is pos positively surreal that um, security elites in, in America and Europe should be talking about that the melting of the Arctic ice cap is a danger because China might sail some more ships through the Arctic, uh, rather than the prospect that this will eventually drown Miami, um, let alone, of course, Bangladesh and so many other places around the world. So yes, I mean, we have uh, other things to think about elsewhere in the world. and. Another thing to remember from this point of view is that over the past 35 years, we have seen a whole set of radical developments, events in the world, you know, which seriously transformed or perhaps in some cases should have transformed but didn't the international situation, the collapse of communism and the Soviet bloc, 9-11, the radical rise of China, the, the 2008 recession, COVID. Uh, now, we don't know what's coming down the line in the next three or four decades, but we can be absolutely certain, um, mathematically certain, I would say, that something is. Uh, and from that point of view, it makes sense to reduce as far as possible the existing dangers um, and commitments that we are making. As far as the contours, well, one contour of a, of a future settlement in, in Europe as a whole, I mean, once again, in present circumstances, given the positions of all sides, this looks hardly likely, but I think it's worth remembering it. It's something that Tom wrote before the war, that um, the only way out of these territorial disputes um, not just in Ukraine, but in the Caucasus, in the Balkans, and I would say elsewhere in the world as well, in principle, um, which has democratic legitimacy, universal applicability, and, um, uh, you, you know, I mean, morality, basically, is in the end to consult the wishes of the people themselves in the territories concerned. It is striking to me, how, well, it's been completely ignored by the West 
in Ukraine uh, and largely in the Caucasus, while of course it has been absolutely insisted upon by the West in the case of the Balkans. Um, now, you know, a measure of inconsistency in geopolitics is, is to be expected. But nonetheless, um, somebody asked this question in the chat and I would agree with it completely. Um, the, the, the people of the territories concerned should have a say. Now, by the way, on that score, you know, having visited Ukraine um, and visited uh, one of the areas that Russia has claimed to annex, but has not um, actually managed to do so, which is the city of Zaporizhia, um, I, I can assure everybody uh, that um, in that area, at least, if the local population was indeed consulted, <laughs> you would have a very low vote for joining Russia, uh, not surprisingly after a year of being bombarded, and a very high vote to stay in Ukraine. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the people on the ground have, in the end, a democratic right to a say, which, alas, nobody is prepared to allow them at present. Uh, but um, nonetheless, we should keep matters like this in mind if we are looking, as I hope we will, uh, towards um, ultimately a, a stable and lasting peace in Europe. Well, thank you, um, uh, Anatole. I think that was not only insightful, but uh, almost perfectly timed in accordance with the allotment that we have for this discussion. So that will be the last word. I want to uh, thank all of our panelists for participation today. I think it's been an enormously valuable discussion. Uh, and for those of you uh, tuning in, uh, Anatole's paper uh, is available on the Quincy Institute website. That's quincyinst.org. Uh, thank you all the audience for joining us today, and we will look forward to our next Institute event. Thank you. Thank you all so much.